Now we're going to move into finishes. Um, uh, the old joke, what's the best finish to use? The one your finisher knows how. Um, this particular client wanted our cherry. I, I don't know if you remember the photo of the cherry that had all the mineral streaking and figure in it. Well, this is that same wood, but she wanted it to have a brownish tone and she wanted it to be coated with an ammonia. That's a technique um, used on oak, sometimes called fuming, and it requires a good bit of craftsmanship. Some of the new penetrating hardening oils that come in dozens of colors would have been so much easier to use, but you do like to do what the client asks you to do. This particular client wanted to see um, some color consistency, so he he arranged the boards before he installed them, and it may be counterintuitive, but that actually takes less time when you're installing a wood floor in particular to rack out the wood before you nail it down. And then he used an oil finish to get that warm, consistent color. This architect wanted to see some color variation in the walls outside the restaurant, so we installed randomly and he used a water-based product a water-based polyurethane product that would not add any color to the wood and would leave some inconsistencies in the color. Uh, can you see the uh, reception desk made out of a heart cypress log? The boat builder out of Charleston came to Goodwin and picked out this log and then carved it and actually had to use again the solvents and the heat treatment to get the finish to take, but it was a nice treatment. Um, here's a, a blue floor in a very ultra-modern building and the marketing team that worked here wanted the wood to match the blue cabinetry that they had. So we used a PPG stain, they wanted a polyurethane, I think it was three parts colonial blue, one part black, and then we had to do a water black wash on it, and then two coats of polyurethane. Now about four years after it had been installed, I got a call from the owner, Nancy Walker, and she said, could you come down and look at the floor? We're getting some wear spots. And I asked what the cleaning crew was using. And she said, oh no, they're not, they tell us they're not using any water on the floor. So when I arrived at midnight, there was the five gallon bucket of water. Um, so we were able to teach the cleaning crew to use just the terry cloth mops with a flat mop head and to actually spray the wood floor cleaner onto the mop head not directly on the floor. Water over time will wear away your finish. And we got Nancy a couple more coats, uh, an, an inexpensive abrade, and recoat before the wood floor wore through. So this floor should be good to go for several more years with the proper maintenance. Distressed floors, this, like this hand scraped one, can actually hide some minor blemishes or scratches but they can also be a little more of a challenge to maintain and to refinish. Um, 50 years ago, when a wood floor was installed in a gymnasium, you would see a line of men across the floor hand scraping because they didn't have the big sanders and this is the way we had to finish floors. You can actually have the kerf marks and the wire brushing that were the way wood had to be made years ago before the prevalence of modern saws and modern finishing equipment. All right, we're, we're about done here, and I want to end up with just a few case studies to reemphasize some of the points that I've made. I think you can tell what went wrong when the roofer had been welding on the roof and went to lunch, and the owner wanted to reproduce the home, the bottom picture is the end result, exactly as it had been. So the millwork company called out of Brooklyn and they asked our brand new sales lady for a quote on three inch antique heart pine, seven feet and longer, and didn't mention any of the other specifications that you might consider in historic restoration growth rings, length of, you know, average length of boards, knots, whether or not there can be any. Um, in this case, the painter refused to accept any resinous boards because he was concerned they would not take a finish, which isn't so, but at any case. Um, we made good on the project. We do have a list in your handout of 
about a dozen questions that you really want to go through with your reclaimed wood provider uh, when you're trying to do historic restoration. Um, another favorite project was the 1877 home where the toilet had overflowed on the second floor and when the owners got home the plaster was hanging down in the kitchen so they called the restoration company who again um, pulled up the wood and used the three-day drying technique they did not account for two inch thick 12 inch wide antique heart pine joists that are not going to dry out in three days um, so the wood was installed right before Christmas everybody was in a hurry I don't really know why this flooring installer didn't use a moisture meter I know him he's very good I assume it was his sub crews that forgot to measure the moisture content this was a leaky home to begin with an old home with a crawl space and along about April when the heat was turned off uh, our phone rang and the owner asked me to come down and look at his floor that was cut. So I um, expected the moisture to be going up in the floor. So I took my moisture meter and I also took two 6D um, nails and I could put them into the wood floor over the joist about a quarter inch at a time so that I could touch the pins on the moisture meter to them and take a reading and then I could hammer them into the wood floor and on into the joists about a quarter inch at a time. And the top of the floor was reading 9%, a quarter inch was reading 11%, then to 14%, and on down to 21% moisture content into those nice, thick, antique heart pine joists. It was not a complete disaster. We were able to pull up some of the badly buckled boards and replace a little bit of wood, dry out the site, um, the finish had to be abraded so that the wood would dry and then reinstall the floor. It's so important to use a moisture meter. This floor probably should not have been installed at 8 or 9 percent, but more like 10 or 11 percent, which is what the rest of the house was reading. And my favorite case study, this is the Hunt Lodge where I visited after the floor had been received and um, we had dried the site out. Now, this formula comes out of the Wood Engineering Handbook. So you can do it yourself, or you can call our COO, he'll do it for you. He does it for flooring professionals all the time. If we know the width of the material, in this case it was 7 inch wide heart pine, and we know the maximum shrink swell for the species and the grain orientation. So in the case of heart pine plain sawn, it's 7.5%. Um, it's kind of interesting that, that red oak is 9.6%, so heart pine's really much more stable than red oak. Um, we also know that the fiber saturation point for longleaf pine is 25.5%. Sometimes about this time in the presentation, people will ask me, how do you dry out the river recovered logs? Well, a tree, when it's growing, is already at fiber saturation point. So we can cut the logs down, put them in the river. We actually put them back into a log pond at the sawmill if we're not going to saw them right away to avoid the sun cracking the outside of the wood. So, so we know that the fiber saturation point is good for this species at about 25.5%. We were able to calculate because we knew the delta, the, the wood after the plywood had dried out was measuring about five and a half percent and we knew it was going to grow to about eight or eight and a half percent so we used a delta of two and a half percent moisture content and calculated that each board was going to grow almost a sixteenth of an inch so we, we talked to the flooring installers and turns out they had never left an expansion joint um, we often do that in the south so what we did is buy a bag of washers for them and teach them to put a washer between each of the boards every so often so that there was an expansion space left during the installation. They had thought about using pennies, but we said, no, you don't want to use pennies. That will leave a mark on the edge of the board. Um, and sure enough, 
Some two or three months later, the floor had grown and the cracks closed up and the owners were quite happy. And this is my favorite thing to show architects. So why would you want to use antique wood? It's just so nice that George dresses up to show us some beautiful heart pine and heart cypress or any of the other species you can get. It's part of our history. So I told you I would tell you a story about that long beam. I remember Gail explaining when she was on a team in England, we took this longleaf pine ecosystem and we shipped it all up and down the eastern seaboard and across Europe for all the hotels and palaces and mansions. We actually got those really long beams out of the UK, believe it or not. Um, they'd been cut in Alabama um, in the 1800s. But Gail Story was sitting around a conference table like this one with the design team, wondering where they were going to find one of these old, long, big beams, because it was going to cost so much money to find it, cut it, dry it, import it. And the forester was walking through the room and heard them talking and said, oh, no problem. The architect planted some of those trees 200 years ago when he built this castle. So that shows that architects really do have to think long term. Thank you very much for your time. I will connect you with the real experts and hope that we can be a partner to you and to help you when you need reclaimed wood.